Um, thank you, Anne, and thank you, Verso, uh, as always, and thank you, Mackenzie, for writing this really, really exciting and uh, I think also beautifully written and provocative text. Um, I think it us. Um, I think the word provocative is used a lot just to say something somewhat interesting, but this actually is a book that provokes. Um, and before we get going, there's a particular line in it that I really think it um, performs well, which is the historical art of telling stories otherwise. Um, this is a book about thought experiments, but ones that I think you're all gonna find more compelling than you imagine when you first hear the idea when you read the book, because I think it is truly an intervention. Um, and in order to get started and get you guys to understand <laughs> Good. Um, a sense of what the kind of core kernel idea of this book is and how lovely it's written. I'm going to ask Mackenzie to read a couple of paragraphs I chose that I really like that I think get to the heart of it. Thank you, Natasha. All right. All right. <laughs> okay. What if we took a more daring modernist defamiliarizing approach to writing theory. What if we asked if theory is a genre, that it be as interesting, as strange, as poetically or narratively rich as we ask our other kinds of literature to be? What if we treated it not as high theory with pretensions to legislate or interpret other genres, but as low theory, as something vulgar, common, even a bit rude, having no greater or lesser claim to speak of the world than any other? It might be more fun to read. It might tell us something strange about the world. It might, just might, enable us to act in the world otherwise. A world in which the old faith and history is no more, but where there are histories that still might be made in a pinch. The end of the dominance of capitalism as a mode of production is not a subject that received much useful attention. For its devotees, it has no end. Uh, it is itself the end of history. For its enemies, it can only end in communism. If communism, a state that exists mostly in the imaginal realm, always deferred into the future, has not prevailed, then this, by definition, must still be the reign of capital. Let's pause for a moment over the ideological freight attached to this poetic conceit and its consequences. The present is defined mostly in terms of a hoped-for negation of it. Some theology. If capitalism is to be of any use as a historical concept, then the question of its end has to remain an open one. The thought experiment as to whether it may already have been surpassed by another dominant mode ought to at least be one that can be posed. So yeah, thanks. I couldn't find a bit to read, but you did. So I, I just thought it was a good, it's a good bit. <laughs> right. And I think um, the bit takes us into the space of what the book um, kind of guides you through, through throughout, which is, it's the thought experiment, mm -hmm. which um, obviously is tempting us with the title, Capital is Dead. Um, when I was uh, promoting this event on Twitter, I got various responses. Some were like, oh, if only it were, hope so. And obviously, um, right. you mean a number of uh, different things and quite playful things with this title. And I was wondering if you could talk about that, like, wasn't capital always dead labor? Like, what yeah. else do you mean? Uh, yeah, that comes up a lot too. And, and it's like, and, and my answer to that one is, yes, capital is dead labor, covered in the first paragraph. Like, yeah, <laughs> deal with that. like that's one meaning of it. Uh, other issues you suggest is the, uh, the longed for end of capitalism, but the assumption that it was always the last exploitative mode of production. And so to sort of open that, uh, the window to what if it wasn't, what if another one was possible? With the caveat that maybe not all of this mode of production has moved into some new thing. Capitalism is still most of what's around us, but there might be something extra added onto it. So could one think multiple modes of production, which are what really exist, but where one of them's novel, mm -hmm. and then what are its novel features then becomes the, the thing one might want to explore. So let's talk about those, that novel aspect. Because as you say, there's often always, in fact, been multiple modes yeah. of production. Something new, something worse. Um, 
the new and the worse, you frame it as a, a sort of laminated layer mm. above capitalism, one that under which capitalism is subsumed, and it's a class relation, a class relation between what you describe as the vectoralist class and the hacker class. Tell us what you mean. Whomst, yeah. where, who, and there, what. And there's a few pieces to that, and uh, like a lot of um, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century Marxism is all about uh, the relationship between capitalist class and landlord class, and how as an agrarian economy that's not capitalist, in, in relation to capitalism, and then what's the relationship of worker to peasant? Like those are, you know, there are whole books on that. Kautsky is on about it forever. Uh, but at some point, we sort of, you know, we took Lukash at his word that, oh, what, let's just think about capitalism and forget about its relation to the rest. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of a tendency to do that. Uh, so I wanted to sort of not do that. And then it's not capitalism, it's worse. It's a way of getting out of those uh, sort of ideological gambits from the Cold War which were like, class struggles over everybody, don't worry about it. We have the liberalism of the centre, we'll solve everything. So there is a post-capitalist discourse that's sort of liberal and in denial about class. Mm -hmm. um, but what I wanted to ask is, what if there are new classes? Mm -hmm. And then what would be their contours? Mm -hmm. And for me, the, the thing that uh, is, is most worth thinking about is uh, commodification moves from land, that's kind of agrarian mode of production, to fungible things, commodification then moves to information. And so what's involved in that extra leap into something even more abstract, which whole new kinds of legality have to be involved for it to even exist at all, uh, for it even to be a thing. But more pressingly, a whole new technics sort of evolves to create the possibility of new kinds of exploitative relation based on asymmetries of information, mm -hmm. which is sort of, I think, you know, partly where we are. So, you know, like, who's got one of these? Almost everybody in the room, right? So it gives you bits of information when you need it, but it gets more back from us. So it's not quite exploitation, because it doesn't quite seem like the same kind of relation, but it's definitely an asymmetry, and it's definitely a power relation where we are not empowered uh, by it. So I think that was the part I wanted to get at. Maybe that's a different kind of class relation, of which this is just an emblem. There's so many other dimensions, obviously, yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I suppose what, um, you know, people who are very much committed to uh, the Lukács model and also find it surprising and maybe a bit scary to think about talking about class relations and not talking about capitalism um, might throw at you, like, well, why can't we just put in some modifiers. Can we not, and as relevantly, talk about techno-capital? Yeah. Um, and I actually really like the way in which, in the book, part of the thought experiment is like, well, maybe, but what if mm. new language yeah. intervening in this present moment gives better space for thinking about these class relations. So how do you respond when someone's like, well, aren't you just talking about techno-capitalism? Yeah, I mean, there's a few bits to that. And, you know, I'm a Marxist, but Marx invented a language. Like, a lot of what he does is, is find uh, ways to repurpose terms, uh, ways to appropriate language but change its meaning. Uh, but then we got into this habit where to be a Marxist is then to not do that at all, but to stick mm. with the one that he gave us. And I'm kind of like, I think that's not really kind of how to do it, you know. Uh, so, yeah, there's that piece. I think, you know, Marx is kind of a genius at making up language. So let's be Marxists who make up language. And, and that, to me, is how you continue in that tra mm. tradition. It's like a better yeah. homage. I think so. But, you know, I, I don't think a lot rests on that claim. But to mm. me, that's, that's what that means. But the other is, why are people who hate it so invested in it being capitalism? Mm. Like, what is this perverse love of it having to be capitalism when it's what the thing that you want to overthrow? I think there's a kind of emotional... Uh, like, there's something weird about, you know... Marxists need to go into therapy, basically, to figure out why this thing of this intense love for this thing, because I always get this thing of, yeah, like, oh, no, you just have to, like, change a few things and you explain it. And it's like, oh, there's a metaphysics at work here where what you're saying is only the appearances change, but the essence remains the same. For eternity! It's always capitalism. Like, that's always the answer. And that strikes me as, as digging into a kind of theological conception. You know, the, the spirit remains the same. 
until the second coming. Mm. Like, we've not left that space, and I think we need to leave it. Yeah. And I think possibly that is also driven by um, a fear of the way in which, if we are to continue and, and put stock in this stock mm. in the thought experiment, um, to say, look, look, there is, there is a laminating over <laughs> and a dominant mm. new class relation, and it's more abstracted. Mm. It's not necessarily more rational. It's more abstracted, yeah. and actually it's ontologically weird, and we actually don't yet understand it. Mm. I think it's scary yeah. for people. Yeah, so the thing is, if you just modify the existing language, you start to see how the present looks like the past, but you don't see the parts of it that are weird. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a... I, and I, I would not want to go to the other extreme where everything is new, like right. there's this whole sort of, we're not doing that, you know. Uh, it's like, how are things not quite... You know, how little change is not quite capturable, either by sticking to an existing language or just, like, you know, trying to uh, invent one out of whole cloth. I'm not doing that. It's no. like I think what I'm trying to do is rooted in a certain tradition of innovating out of a language to try to understand how things transform. And so you're not kind of stuck calling something neoliberal capitalism because it's just, you know, I was never a good poet, but I recognise bad poetry <laughs> when I see it, and that is just... I'm sorry. <laughs> You, you stuck a modifier on the thing and your modifier has a modifier, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not hostile to theory and making up language, but it's just bad, yeah? And neoliberal in itself explains certain things, but then you try to make it explain everything as a modifier for a thing that you then don't think about because you just shoved a modifier on it. So, I don't know, it's just, it's not how to write. I yeah. just don't think this is how to write. To read, to read a line from a very good writer, um, uh, the, the Marxist original project was to subject the language of our time to critical pressure. Yeah. And I feel mm. like, but you wrote that. So <laughs> I feel like that's what, we, what this oh, book... Oh, nodding along. Yeah, somebody smart said yeah, that. So it's very wise, it's very wise, it's very good. <laughs> um, but um, to carry on from what you were saying about the things that are missed when you just add modifier mm. around modifier and what you might miss by not interrogating and pushing towards a better grammar, a better language of the present. Um, the way in which you seem to kind of insist that we don't do that is by insisting that we look at the forces of yeah. production mm -hmm. and not get all too comfortable just talking about the relations of production. Yeah. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, well, A, for people that aren't like well versed in Marx things, mm. what you mean? Mm -hmm. and be um, like where you think people have overlooked forces and why you think that's such a necessary thing. Yeah, and I, and I want it to be like the most vulgar of vulgar Marxists. Yeah, and, and, and we're going to talk more of, about vulgarity. Yeah, and it's like what are the forces of production because they, they, they're dynamic, they change, this is a thing that, that Marx kind of grasps. Uh, but Marx is talking about there of the steam engine mm. and he gets as far as thinking what thermodynamics is and doesn't get as far as the sort of next wave of waves of sort of technical development that happened after that. I mean, Engels, towards the end of his life, is super interested in the chemical industry and sort of gets why it's a new thing. Uh, and there are hints in Marx of where he gets how uh, instrumentalising something that other people would call cognitive labour is, is something sort of quite specific. Uh, he talks about the general intellect. Uh, how is capital able to subordinate that? But it's not really thought through, you know, in terms of what even the technique of that time is, and it's not the technique now. I think the thing that's really crucial is, like, people were wrestling with how, you know, heat engines were a weird thing, not really accounted for in the thinking of the philosophy mm -hmm. of the time, in Marx's time. But now we're grappling with what the hell is information? Right. Like it's weird and slippery. None of the philosophies of it really even quite make sense. Uh, so how is it uh, a relatively new thing that doesn't just occur as a thought out of nowhere, it comes because the force of production got to the point where it becomes a concept you can develop. So uh, in what way did the development of the force of production crash through and change the relations of production such that they're new and new classes get created? So in that sense, I'm the most vulgar old-fashioned Marxist you could possibly imagine, but I'm just saying it overshot the historical story as we've absorbed it. Uh, and that's the thing I think that needs thinking through, and, and thinking through collectively, because I don't yeah. understand a lot about the, tech, the techniques 
Nobody I know does, but, <laughs> but you have to then, you know, how do we have collaborative knowledge production with others who know other things where we treat them as comrades and not think we can explain, you know, like humanities explain them like you'd mansplain how they don't understand anything. Like it's just not how to... Right, like yeah. philosophy above everything else. Yeah, I'm, I'm really going. hostile to this sense of there being like a sovereign kind of knowledge over mm. all the others and, and Marxist philosophy is often claimed to be that and I think it's a, a deadly mistake. Absolutely. Um, and, um, yeah, I realised that we skipped a little bit because uh -huh. um, talking about the, the, this new layer, this dominant layer of class relations, we haven't talked about the, the various aspects of that, the vectoralist oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. the hacker. And these are the mm. two terms that you use. I mean, vector, I'm like... Yeah, figuring you get know. from Virilio. It's, it's like I'm, I'm saying that, yeah. Nearly but do you want to kind of explain? Poetry. So is this. They weren't good terms, but I, this is language I developed um, uh, really at the end of the last century to try to sort of figure out. Uh, all right, so if there's if it's possible to be a ruling class without actually owning the forces of production anymore, which is where we are. Mm. That's what's kind of bizarre about it. Uh, like Apple doesn't make phones, right? I don't yeah. make them. You just outsource all that. Uh, is there a ruling class that's able to have dominance even over capital? And it, as traditionally understood, is owning the force of production. And actually there is. And you do it through the ownership of the brands, the copyrights, the patents. But I think more importantly, like the vector. So the entire logistics is in the hands of Apple and is proprietary. Mm -hmm. You don't get access. No one gets access. So, yeah, how do you control the entire value chain through information? That, that struck me as the key question to start thinking about. And I just think of information uh, not so much as a stock or a flow, as direction. So vector was the word that I settled on. And yes, the late Paul Virilio was, I think, really inspiring for me. Uh, information technology mostly comes out of warfare, which is another reason that we missed it, because it's not in the economic story. It's mm. in the military story. And Virilio got that bit. So yeah, I called the new ruling class the vectorless class, which is not necessarily the best term. I, I'm not wedded to it, but <laughs> yeah, that's where I ended up. And then well, what does it mean to work with information? Because I'm sure most of us here do, yeah? Like we're not factory workers in the sense that we don't work a machine that has repetition built into it. We're actually supposed to be doing a different thing all the time that gets shoved into the same commodity form. So what does it mean not to be making sameness, which is what factory labor is, but to be making difference? Like that's our freaking job. Uh, and that's weird. Uh, so I called it not the working class, not workers, but hackers. But trying to generalize that away from just computers, yeah? It's like you make information, make new information out of old, that's to hack. Good old fashioned Saxon word, yeah? Uh, but it's, it's a word that ended up meaning a few too many different things, so I'm not kind of wedded to it, but. Yeah, because it, it's yeah. Got a, it got a bit in Selly in these Yeah, 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 yeah. that's, <laughs> so, definitely didn't want to go there. And it's, no, it's a but little, I, like, but why it's not? It's a little too mask, and that ain't me anymore. It, no. you know? <laughs> that's a whole other story, but, but, but uh, I mean, but it's sort of like, I'm not trying to persuade anybody to use my language, but I am trying to persuade people to, try to be inventive with language and mm. think through what are things that describe but can become concepts through which you can grasp a lot of the abstract social relations in which we're embedded and which work against us. And yeah, and actually at one point, a couple of points in the book, I, that kind of I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, was um, when you highlight these kind of moments of shifts of economic history that we're quite comfortable talking about um, without much interrogation, we talk about deregulation, financialization, um, often in this kind of very passive mm. voice of like, it yeah. just happened by the demands of capital, mm. without really investigating or demanding an understanding of like, what conditions of infrastructure needed mm. to be in place. Um, and I feel like the way in which talking about a vectoralist class and a yeah. hacker class, even if we switch out the terms, gives us maybe a better or at least fuller way of talking about that, or just like demands that we do. Um, so I feel like as I was going through your thought experiments, I was like, good points, very good. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and there's sort of like to massively simplify a little historical story. Like there's, I think there's a moment when the, uh, the working class of the overdeveloped world basically kind of fights capital to a standstill. And uh, capital's response to that is, fuck, is there a way we can root around the power that labor has started to accrue? 
uh, and we're talking 60s and 70s, Europe, United States, Japan. Uh, let's reach out to uh, communication, computation, you know, find ways we can just route around them so they're not able to block and use the power of the strike and so forth, or use the state to, to regulate us or to control us. So let's build a new infrastructure that works around it. And they did. But I think it ended up being a devil's bargain for capital because it means creating an opening for another class to form that controls, you know, capital thought can control labor through this, and it did, but there's another class ends up controlling capital mm -hmm. built on top of it that's basically like, all right, we're going to control your whole shit through information. So then to see the regulatory steps as responding to forces on the ground rather than this sort of just so political theory story of like blah 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 and then there was neoliberalism. Yeah, like to me it's neoliberalism is the thing to be explained. It's not explanatory. So what in the forces of production made that possible? What uh, moment in class struggle made people reach for those forces of production? Those are the sorts of questions that I think need to be asked. I'm not the only person to ask them, by the way, but, uh, but I wanted to put it in a nice, short, polemical kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody had done that. Absolutely. So who are, I mean, like naming names, like where do we make the cuts of like who is a vectoralist? Like who <laughs> is owning the vectors and who is a capitalist? Like obviously these things work together, landlords and capitalists work together, uh -huh. mm -hmm. landlords and vectoralists work together. How many vectoralists are there? Is it, I mean, obviously yeah. this sort of power is more and more concentrated in, in yeah. this most profound way. I mean, Bezos, vectoralist. Yeah, well, that's the thing. And, and, what is, and isn't? You just look at uh, the, the top 50 Fortune 500 companies in the United States would be a nice sort of shorthand for it. And you look at the histories of those companies and what they did and what they do now. Uh, Archer Daniels Midland is nearly always on it. And they used to be landowners. Then they got into processed food, right? And now they're into GMOs. So they went through the whole cycle. It used to be about land. Then it was about products. Now it's about owning the information to control the whole value chain through all those other things and divesting yourself of all the other stuff. Yeah? Mm -hmm. It turned out... Um, last financial crisis, the car companies made more money from their loans than they did from the cars. And the reason was they had the information about who is buying what cars and where and what their risk is. So even the car companies turn out to have half a foot in this. On and on it goes. The tech companies don't actually make anything. Uh, but they are the ones who kind of figured out that, oh, you do need an infrastructure. They're not, you know, in, in the, you know, the cloud requires an infrastructure to yeah. exist. Uh, but you could kind of... One. <laughs> aggregate all of the information, and that is the thing through which you control the value chain. Mm -hmm. So the pharmaceutical companies, they don't actually make the drugs. You just, you know, develop the possibility of the drug. You finesse the regulatory system that's in place. You control the patent on it, and you control the copyright that'll go on the box, so you want the brand name one, yeah? So um, most of the visible ruling class in the overdeveloped world, as they call it, um, yeah, is Vectral's class. And mm -hmm. that's before you even get to finance, right? Uh, but that's only part of it. Controlling, uh, if you like, quantitative information is only part. It's also the qualitative information companies like Google and so forth have. So to see all of that together as a kind of controlling of the value chain through being able to amass information and hold it as proprietary, uh, and no longer have to even be all that bothered with the production of the thing, which is the classic model of what capitalism was. Um, so in this um, framework, the subordinate class, which is not the least privileged class, is, is the hacker. Yeah. Um, I mean, can be in dire straits and meant there are different mm -hmm. types of hackers. Yeah. Um, us, the hacker. Um, I'm curious about how this fits in, or, or might fit in as useful. So there's been a number of unionizing efforts, obviously, in media companies and for freelancers and in the tech sector. There's a lot of tech worker organizing yeah. these kind of, uh, hacker, yeah, yeah. according yeah. to mm. the schema we're using here. Um, and I think a lot of the language that's made that possible has been these organizers describing themselves and reaching out to each other as workers. Mm. Um, so is there a way in which talking about a hacker class means that we lose that ability to use that kind of historic affinity of struggle with that term? 
or is there a way that we can combine those terms without doing that god awful modifier thing? Mm. Um, how do you kind of frame yeah, these I'm, movements I'm, within I'm how you're thinking? I'm happy to be uh, to be proven wrong about what's rhetorically more useful. Mm. And it it turned out because it you would have thought 20 years ago there's no way in the world you're going to persuade these people they're workers, so let's do something else. But it's weird how that changed. And I think people see the possibility of what seemed like um, relatively secure uh, life chances not being so. And the other part that's really interesting is people seeing, oh, we're basically making the machines of mass death. Do we really want that to be what we work on? So there's a, like a comp another component to it as well. It's really interesting. But I think that's, yeah, fine. So, so yeah, let's call ourselves workers. The thing that'd be interesting though to think about in what ways is it a different kind of work and a, in what ways are the available strategies different to what people who thought of themselves as workers would have thought, like I'm from a steel and coal town and you know, shut down the port, shut down the trains, shut down the mine. You know, there, there are ways you, that you gained agency that are very much to do with that physical infrastructure. And is that still how you would think about what the agency of this labor is? Uh, and that was a very uh, masculinist model of what the worker was. And is that how we still want to think about the worker? Are we changing how we understand what work is? And there's obviously a long discourse on that, which we don't need to uh, uh, paraphrase. But I, but I think, yes, let's call it worker, fine, whatever. But then to think again a little bit about um, if we're going to stick with the same language to pay more attention to how it's not quite the same thing. Yeah, and I think we, like a lot of us see this, you see it play out in, in mass protest movements, relying on it being the same thing without considering the shift in information. Yeah. For example, thinking it means the same thing to bring a million people to the National Mall now yeah. as it did 40 years ago. Mm. Um, of course it doesn't, right? One showed immense amount of potency, now it can possibly show mm. capacity given the way information yeah. vectors yeah. Yeah. work. So I think it, you're clearly calling on a relevant necessary point of thinking about forces of production, how mm. things work. You brought up just just few minutes ago about, um, you know, writing in like 20 years ago. And I'm curious about, you know, you were very much part of a media scene, for want of a better word, avant-garde um, of people who like, and this is clear in your earlier work in Hacker Manifesto, a moment that seemed like maybe there's a way of information commons. Mm. Maybe there's a way that we keep this away from the thingness, commodification. Obviously, this book kind of points to the fact that that, that didn't happen. Yeah, I, I feel like we, we won a couple of battles and lost the war. And I'm, I'm thinking of myself as a minor participant in a, a movement to, to recollectivize and resocialize information. And fully aware of the contradictions of that, um, you know, I hope Verso sells enough of these books so that everybody gets paid to keep doing the labor, but on the other hand, they're all going to be PDFs by tomorrow if they're not already, and we have no agency or control over that. And the way those two things interact is deeply weird and strange and, and not even understood. Uh, so, but yeah, we, we thought if we could liberate information, we could decommodify it, uh, and that would be a way to sort of create a, a, a commons or even a communism outside of the commodity form, but it turned out the vectorless class figures out how to commodify that at a more abstract level. So it's like, oh, uh, all these people are doing all of this activity, um, let's charge them, you know, let's, let's charge rent on the commons. And then, you know, I, we used to worry about the culture industries, and it's now like, we have to entertain each other, yeah? Like, all they give you is like the blank page, the blank screen. And you're like, oh, we have to like make all the content in it as well. And you know, like, I, I'm, I long for the culture industry that would make those Hollywood movies you just passively sit back and watch, you know? So it's not a culture industry, it's like a vulture industry, you know? It's just like picking us off at the. So yeah, this, we, we tried it. Like, we tried, and you know, and I'm, I'm here, you know, with love. There are a lot of people did this, and it's still a not unimportant thing that we have our own archives, that there's information that can escape commodification. I, I, those strategies are still valued. They're just not. They can't be the main one anymore. And I know. Outflanked. And the and the outflanking and the yeah. like. Yes, the ability of this incredibly abstracted and incre and all the more powerful 
because of it, mm. vectorialist class, um, thinking of strategies becomes harder and obviously relying on old models becomes sillier and sillier. Mm. Um, this book is very much an opening and a demand to think of the present and its class relations better or more carefully. It doesn't really tell us like what to do. Um, what sites of like aperture and opening of like a what to do are you seeing that you're like, hmm, good? Um, I mean, the um, international women's strike comes to mind. Well, that was a great idea. Uh, and it's, it's bigger in certain other parts of the world than here. But it's a repurposing of what strike could mean. It moves strike into the world of social reproduction, mm -hmm. uh, out of the sort of the production sphere model of it. Uh, you can't shut down the, the uh, industrial side of how a city functions, but you can shut down the trans the circulation of everything else, which is in some parts of the world what uh, Women's Strike did. Uh, Black Lives Matter was, was really significant uh, in understanding how much uh, not just uh, carceralization, but the kind of uh, attack on the every last margin of everyday life by the information vector through surveillance and so on, uh, algorithmic policing, so it addresses all of that. Uh, it addresses the collapse of a lot of local government uh, that now are just basically rent extracting out of their own populations. So yeah, you see people figure out uh, parts of it the question is always, how do you see the parts as different parts of the same elephant? You know, you're sort of perceiving it, uh, little bits of it, but how is all of that running on the same infrastructure? How is it running on the same technology? How is it using the same techniques? How is some of the languages of domination the same, even though the languages of insubordination are all different? So it's sort of like understanding that picture a little bit uh, was what I hope this was a modern, modest contribution towards. And, I mean, part of the contribution is also, um, like, many both funny and informative jabs, are, who, the various both historical and contemporary um, figures that you describe as genteel Marxists, and in um, contrast, and uh, that to which towards you, towards you advocate is um, vulgar Marxism, which has obviously been... Um, a slur used in, as you point out, like many, there have been many different kinds of vulgar Marxism mm. as a slur, like whatever then gets to the next stage that people decide to call vulgar Marxism. They're like, that's vulgar. First it was too dialectical, then it was not dialectical. <laughs> um, yeah. And, but you're like, let's go vulgar. Tell me about vulgarity. Well, I mean, my, my early training was, yeah, working class militants, like they weren't, they hadn't been to Cambridge. <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking more of our comrades at NLR, <laughs> and review, and, you know. Uh, yeah, they, they, you know, like the, the first person who really trained me was uh, a former merchant seaman, you know, uh, and, you know, union activist and militant and revolutionary. And, 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 you know, some people had been to university, but, but they were school teachers, you know. So, and, and the, the culture of it was definitely vulgar. Of, of, you know, sort of the provincial labour movement. I'm a provincial too, so how could I ever be genteel, you know? <laughs> uh, so, so it was part of it, well, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not. I'm just not from a world of a certain kind of um, cultural capital. So it doesn't make sense to me that you would sort of shut down vulgarity in all of its meanings. But it has particular conceptual meanings to do with... Uh, a kind of assumption that paying attention to the base level of the uh, social structure, uh, the forces of production, I would say forces of production and reproduction, that somehow, no, 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 that's too reductive and too simple. We need to think about the superstructures, we need to think about the autonomy of politics, of culture as a separate sphere and so forth, and I think we really went a little bit too far down that track and it wouldn't hurt to go, you know what, changes in the force of production might drive a lot of historical you know, changes as well. Let's pay attention to that and connect it to that sense that the people from whom you can learn are the people who are experiencing what those forces of production are doing to them in their working lives and their everyday lives. And then who are the organic intellectuals of those changes? Who are the people who have, you know, not only experienced that, but have understood how to articulate it? Uh, so to me, that, that was why I was involved in sort of media avant-garde in the 90s. It's like, oh yeah, this, you guys figured out. You have these shit day jobs with computers. 
but you, it has all this potential that's unexplored. So how do you create agency in that, in that gap? And so is this the kind of, like, if the, the kind of calling to action or at least, like, thought um, for those of us who might be here who are like, oh, it's, I think there's a line there that's like, you don't even put your own work into the WordPress of your website. And like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> perhaps I just email my editor. Um, part of that kind of, uh, well, so do you. <laughs> um, partly that, um, that world of presuming the kind of sovereign, like sovereign space of like the word makers. Yeah. And you miss so much. So if you are talking about hacker class consciousness, the collective experience has to be that of experience and like sharing those knowledges. It, it, it's funny, and I, and I lost the ability to do a lot of this, but, you know, because I was sort of trained by these like, um, you know, provincial militants in, in Newcastle, Australia. Uh, then I went to Sydney and I'm like, oh, I want to be a writer, but so I need to understand the forces of production. So, so I tried to learn printing and sucked at it. And then I learned pre-press, but this was all pre-digital. So I learned how the bromide camera works. Anyone even know what a bromide camera was? There's one Nothing. hand for the live streamers. <laughs> Nothing. Yeah, right. Uh, but yeah, and it's like, you know, how do I do the layout? How do you do all of the reproduction to, to do that? How do you do the pre-press? So I kind of weirdly thought to be a writer, I had to know how it got made. <laughs> and, and, but then um, desktop publishing came along. The typesetting machines were changing every two to three years. And then Apple came along and just destroyed the type, specialized typesetting machine business. So I kind of saw a little bit in the working life I thought I was entering, you know, in the 80s. And I just thought, oh, that's a thing to try to pay attention to, yeah? How do you figure out uh, who knows what's going on because it's affecting their, not just their, their job job, but their life, you know, everything around it through transformations. And yeah, and then I suppose that is a, it, it points to a, a vast challenge ahead of us when a number of the workers to enable, the, the kind of laborers that enable the vectorialists to have a hacker class, for example, are content moderators mm. in mm. content farms, you know, halfway, more than halfway across right. the world. Yeah, because that's the thing. I mean, there were always um, global relations of, uh, exploitation and domination, but we have a whole extra layer of them that developed over the last 30 years. Yeah. Uh, so I have often complained about being thrown off Facebook or Twitter, as I'm sure some of you have as well. And But it's sort of like, yeah, there was someone, you know, looking at content and clicking freaking buttons on the other side of the world made that decision in seven seconds, and they probably have a quota they have to meet. You know what I mean? So, so it's kind of like caught up in that. Mm -hmm. And they're probably seeing like dick pic, dick pic, <laughs> dick pic. I don't know what that is. <laughs> you know, like, this is probably a really shitty job to content moderate, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, to sort of try to get out of the, the overdeveloped world to think the rest of it as well would be part of this. And how has that sort of been massively enabled by a uh, huge drop in the cost of information circulating globally that happened? It's really only 30 years old that that's right. happened. Um, and, yeah, and so much of the, the newness. Can someone let me know about time as well? Am I are we? Five minutes. Okay, so if we only have five minutes, I have just two more questions, right. and then you guys I'm go trying, for I'm it. Trying to be brief. No, you're being very, very <laughs> precise. I'm the rambler. Um, there's a perennial and very annoying debate that has been going. It seems like at least my whole lifetime, times a bazillion, of um, the kind of class-first leftist mm. versus um, what I suppose the class-first leftist would call idpol identity politics. Mm humans um, and this kind of inability to talk well or engage with intersectionality um, and the class first folks um, often seem unable to articulate what they kind of mean by class and I'm curious mm. how your schema, your thought experiment yeah. might even help or intervene well by adding another <laughs> class relation into this I think really unfortunate debate. I mean, as a provocation, if you're calling it identity politics, you don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. like it, if, if that's where you start, you actually don't know what it is. Uh, we're talking about liberation movements, yeah? Right. Uh, I, that's just fundamental, and I grew up through those. Like, I grew up through uh, anti-colonialism, uh, anti-racism, yeah? And it wasn't about fucking identity at all. It, it was about the possibility of, 
of being able to work or to live at all, yeah? Um, central issue to do with race in America is obviously mass incarceration. It's not about fucking identity. Right. It's about being locked up and killed. It's the opposite of identity politics. So if you're calling it that, you've not understood it. And you're paying way too much attention to the uh, learning process of 20-year-olds in liberal arts colleges. Right. Which not to, not to, <laughs> not to speak ill of that, because that's important. And I, I, I don't want to be parodying that. Right? But that's not the central thing that's going on when we talk about race or gender, right. transphobia, or any of those things. Yeah? Um, so let's just not even go there. Right? Um, how do you understand what Black Lives Matter says about class in terms of mass incarceration? Yeah? Like that seems fundamentally about class right. to me. And I, I am a class first Marxist who mm. just completely disowns what that label is usually meant. Right. Because to me that means what do people of colour say? What do women say? What do trans people say about what their daily experiences of uh, oppression and exploitation are? Yeah? Um, that, that just seems fundamental to me. But we get caught up in you know, taking seriously what are essentially right-wing discourses that Completely. certain pseudo-leftists think we have to mm -hmm. take as real and serious. This goes all the way back to the attacks on political correctness and postmodernism in the 80s. All this stuff's cooked up in right-wing think tanks. Okay. And now pseudo left wing bloggers think it's a thing and build careers on it. It's bullshit. Red scare. <laughs> not, not, not mentioning any names. Not mentioning any names. So, um, so, so to be a class first Marxist is to think about what are people of colour saying? What are women's, working class women saying? Yeah, that's, that's mm -hmm. the real stuff about and incarceration, which, re reproductive politics, etc. Which yeah. applies whether we yeah. talk in a framework of hacker versus vectoralist or yeah. worker versus capitalist, these things should be yeah, primary. And, then, and how does exploitation or, or I'm calling it asymmetry of information intersect all of that? Exactly. Uh, and a massive uh, intervention of uh, information-based industries into mass incarceration is what we're living through, yeah? Uh, then we're all subject to facial recognition, et cetera, et cetera, uh, as if the algorithms could be trusted, which we all know they can't, yeah? Like, the, the thing with, with algorithmic policing is, you know, it's basically racism in, racism out, with the black box of the algorithm in the middle. You take old-fashioned policing, turn it into an instrumentalised kind of information, you get the same result out, you know. So, yeah, it's just... Can't even. Can't even. <laughs> shan't even. So I think, you know, I could go on, but I think we get... Basically um, right, right come yes, that. and then, so yeah. my final question, which completely relates, before yeah. it's over to you guys, is... Um, as you were writing this book, you began transitioning. I did. And yeah. congratulations, that's amazing. Thank you. Uh, looking amazing. Yeah. Um, and curious how that process, whilst writing a book, informed the book and now informs how you think about the work you've done in the book now, because it's, you don't mention any of it in the book. Yeah. Yeah, I wrote another book. It was all about transition at the same time I wrote that one. Okay. So I had a year off, so I kind of did both at once. It's not in there. Um, a lot after I came out, it, it turned out there were a lot of trans women in um, computer science for all sorts of weird, complicated reasons, and several told me, yeah, 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 read Hacker Manifesto years ago, it's really trans. And I'm like, i got to read it again. What did I not know about myself when I wrote that book? You know, it's like, that's super weird. Um, yeah, so I wrote a book that basically is a big fuck you to all Marxists who think like cops, because I felt like I could take it in public, and now I probably can't because I'll cry. Uh, so it's a little weird them. to be, yeah, repping that book now. Um, but yeah, and it maybe, it, to me it sort of is a bit of the end of a certain mode of, of how I used to write and stuff after that will be different. I'm really proud of this book actually, I was just thinking I've done 13, there's two I'd disown. Oh. Um, but this I think is one of the good ones, at least for me in terms of how it's written. I really yeah. like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, I transitioned and, and it sort of intersects with this in, in a weird way. Um, as being, yeah, I felt like I was summing up uh, an arc of stuff I'd worked on for 20 years. A little bit so I could do something a little different. And I also think, even though it wasn't explicitly mentioned, mm. the idea of not everything always being captured in the kind of work of wordsmithing, mm. but like living in like the bodies we can and sharing them and finding new <laughs> languages that way seemed, knowing you seemed mm. relevant as I was reading it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's, you know, kind of um, vol voluntarily giving up masculinity. I don't know, weirdly seemed to fit with the tone of that book 
but in ways I can't explain. It's like that's that's between me and my therapist. <laughs> <laughs> no, in the <laughs> last couple with. of chapters, I was like, ah, oh, I see it. Yeah, yeah. It's good. Um, thank you for answering my rambling questions. You can ramble. <laughs> thank you, Natasha. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I guess I'd like to, this is a big question, but since white supremacy was formulated, um, partly to uphold and justify capitalism, and we've added a layer to capitalism, which you term the vector class. Mm. Where in the domain of white supremacy do both the vector and the hacker class, class lie? Oh, it's a really good question. And it, that cuts right through it. Uh, and to what extent uh, is the uh, unexamined whiteness of some forms of, uh, you might call it hacker class or information labor or whatever, uh, one of the... Um, things that most needs attention in order to make class alliances in the present. Because I, I, particularly in the United States, like, like race is really the kind of central question. And I say that as someone who works on class, I think race is the central question. Uh, so how do you uh, think through firstly how, if one of the things you want to do is articulate um, to a broader um, radical movement, you know, sort of strata that think they're exempt or think they used to be or should still be, but where they also are the exclusionary in certain ways, like, yeah, that then becomes very central. Uh, but and one of the ways to address it has actually sort of come up through these struggles at some of these tech companies where, you know, some fairly privileged workers, not all of whom are white, obviously, I don't want to be heard as saying that, are saying, why the fuck do, do we have contracts with ICE? How are we implicated in, you know, some of the most brutal forms of... Uh, white supremacist racialization. Uh, why, why are we working for you know the police to start asking those questions? I think on the uh, what's the labour for side, as well as on the how do you make alliances beyond uh, narrow-based uh, industry politics or sectoral politics to sort of see it as part of a movement. Thanks, Mackenzie. This was uh, this is really cool. Uh, I definitely agree with the importance of trying to develop new concepts for a language of domination, like you were talking about, and kind of relating them to old ones, especially ones that have kind of been debunked or that we don't really use anymore. Um, you know, one very prominent kind of mythos within capitalism is, of course, like the invisible hand, right? The invisible hand kind of yeah. like this bodily kind of force that manages the market. And, you know, in the 2000s, or yeah, in the 2000s, the invisible hand begins to be debunked, and it's debunked on the grounds that information is asymmetric. Information is asymmetric, so you can't have an invisible hand. But this information asymmetry um, is what you are identifying as a kind of invitation for us to consider, you know, other relations of domination beyond capital. So, you know, do you think that from the autopsy of the invisible hand that we can maybe detect new kind of tendrils or claws or kind of new appendages in this form of political economy that we're examining? And, and you know, moreover, what do you think of bodily concepts um, used to describe greater informatic systems? Thanks. So, uh, could you just explain the second bit? Bodily concepts. Oh, yeah, right. Oh, like hands. Hand. Got, got uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah um, and, you know, as, as among other things, good Nietzschean, there's, there's something metaphoric about all language. Uh, um, and and my, my first thought was uh, to go back to C.B. McPherson, who has this whole thing about in, in sort of bourgeois ideology, the, the invisible hand is just arranging, allocating resources. Meanwhile, the invisible foot kicks the shit out of everybody at the bottom <laughs> of it. You know? That's not quite C.B. McPherson's version, but that's what I remember from when I read it you know, like a long, long time ago. So there's, there's ways in which one of the things one plays with in language is, is corporeality. 
Uh, the other example that comes to mind then for me then is um, uh, Pasolini's unfinished novel Petrolio, uh, which which also has but but then it's the, the sexualized body is the way he starts to think the social fabric. Yeah, so so there's a way that one one plays with it, um, but I'm, I also think thinking through the way in which. Uh, to be human is perhaps always and constitutive, constitutionally to have been woven with technology and, and techne and, and the human are, are not separable things. Uh, so there's, there's a way in which these metaphors could be misleading because we sort of lose the sense of that. that, you know, it's, that it's not that we had opposable thumbs so that we could you know, have a tool, it's the tool shaped the thumb together, like the two things evolved together. Yeah. And you do talk about meat grinders and brain fryers. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of there's, body there's, there's sort the of metaphors and, and stuff going on in there, yeah, but trying to be a little playful with it. And a lot of science fiction movies get mentioned. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. fun. Hi, guys. Um, Hi, Andrea. Hi. Um, so, Mackenzie, I'm going <laughs> to... Everyone turn around. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> She's so famous. Mackenzie, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to uh, historicize something which, as you know, is anathema to me. <laughs> um, so I wanted to return to the I think what we were talking about, what you guys were talking about at the, at the top, about the refusal of a certain kind of Marxist to let go of the concept mm. of capital, um, which seems highly ironic for several reasons. One of which seems to be that it's a refusal to historicize, or mm. it's historicizing up until a certain point and then yeah. staying there yeah. and feeling attached to it. And clearly it's like the moment at which theory is, in which the, the fantasy of theory gets laid bare. Mm. There's clearly something that the Marxist wants from the theory that he's yeah. not saying. Um, so I'm wondering if, if you, and perhaps you do this in the book or to invite you to do it now, um, how you would account for that refusal. Like, can, mm -hmm. I, can you historicize the Marxist refusal to historicize, particularly in this moment? Do you think it's unique mm. to this moment? Huh. Oh, God, that's a really hard one, given that um, it's, it's a core part of my own, you know, sort of subjective formation is to be one. Uh, <laughs> And it's one of the few constants since I was, I've been a Marxist since I was like 17 years old, which is a fuck of a long time now. Uh, so I don't know if I'm in the position to, to, to view it from the outside to do that. Um, but I, and it did strike me, and it really does go back to memories of militants who were my teachers, yeah? That, because they would say things like, I won't, I won't live to see communism, but you will. Like it's this sense of being able to pass it on. So like, you could, you could exist in capitalism with this sense that even if you didn't get to see it, the, the sense of its end is inheritable. So I'm sort of taking away the dialectic between those two terms and kind of saying, you know what, maybe it's superseded by something that's worse, and that takes away the possibility of that subjective formation that was so central to me. Um, so, you know, quite frankly, it's my other transition is to, is to get out of you know, that subject, that binary of terms as well. Um, but without, you know, uh, um, yeah, so, so maybe that's as far as I can get with that. Um, and one could think about how did this language get formed and what was it formed against? And what's a sort of nice shorthand for that and what I end the book with is the film, yeah, The Young Marx. Uh, and they're trying to form a language that would be historical against certain ahistorical versions of that were essentially Christian of what artisanal labor could aspire to, uh, the return to Eden and so forth. But it's weird how it sort, of, it, it sort of ended up in that position, that you end up with a sort of a fixed language in its place, that in what are clearly dark times uh, is, I think, very appealing. And I don't want to take too much of that away, because even I need access to some of that language. But, and this is what the Marx and Engels characters are saying in the film, it's not strategically useful. So what might be subjectively necessary and culturally enabling up to a point is not strategically helpful. And to be able to operate with language on a different level about that now strikes me as kind of key. Because like you gotta, you gotta remember, I was alone in the world for many years being a Marxist. 
you know, like you'd find two others and hate them because they'd got it wrong, you know. <laughs> and now it's fucking everywhere, you know what I mean? So the last thing I want to do is, is take that away, but to sort of move it forward a little bit, you know, if we're back. Hi, can you explain what you mean by worse? Oh, yeah, that's a really good question. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, worse in the sense that it's, it's now clear that um, kind of uh, domination achieved through information turns everything on the planet into a possible resource, and there is not enough planet for that to endure for very long at all. Uh, so extinction is going to be worse, and this is a mode of production that's you know, directly aimed at accelerating the process of extinction. So that's the worst of the worst. Um, but it's worse also in the sense of shutting down the little, little spaces in which one might have been uh, free from the extraction of value. So finding those gets harder. In that sense, it's worse. Uh, and it gets harder to find the places of blockage where you could stop the circulation of the commodity economy. Like, you can't shut down the port to, to bring it to its knees, because it, it has ways to root around you, no matter what you do. So those are some of the senses of worse, I think. I mean, the other one I'd add is maybe subjectively it's worse. Um, I'm more prone to mania than depression, uh, but it, people just seem to get really depressed having to be inside of it, yeah? Like there's a subjective side that feels worse, because without possibility. Hey there. Um, the title of the book really reminded me of David Graeber's Bullshit Jobs, <laughs> where, and you know, in that book he talks about how, um, you know, everything's useless now, you could be taping boxes, whatever. And also I have to, I love the front cover where it's keywords, mm. where if capital is dead, you know, I haven't read your book, I'm just discovering it, that it reminds me that everything boils down to YouTube keywords, mm -hmm. that we're all on YouTube, we're all on Instagram, we're all on Facebook, and our content we consume in is basically YouTube celebrities and Let's Play, and this kind of warps our reality, including to, and for the, fortunately, the election of Donald Trump, and that's all this kind of gets into the whole alt-right sphere and meme culture and whatnot. Um, what is your thoughts on the whole YouTube virtual market that we're all now just on Instagram making friends and YouTube because it seems like the capital we are making is we're all being forced to be some nerds on the internet and there's no way out or that the ideal that this is being live stream is the only kind of sad reality or something like that. This yeah. is being live streamed. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's it's sort of that that sense that um, like the the only way forward in one's life is is to be you know performing information labor for free uh to the point that you could find some way to monetize it uh so during my transition i started watching a lot of makeup tutorials you know so it's like oh so someone's trying to like generate enough followers to then be sponsored you know so there's there's a sense in which that becomes a, a kind of uh outsourcing of the risk of generating information anybody would want directly to the point of production. So no one's going to risk investing uh, in the production of information until it's already proven itself. But you still need them to do that because you don't have real access to the infrastructure is sort of the trap one we all get caught in kind of thing. If you're trying to do any job that's not, you know, sort of service work uh, in this particular political economy. So yeah, it's, I think that's very much the sort of, uh, and the book starts with that surface level, that that's sort of exactly where it looks like we are. But then as, you know, not that it's capital, but in, in capital, Marx wants to rip back the veil and show behind that is production. And that's the part I think, you know, the, the other part that needs to be filled out and written. Probably not by me, because I don't have the patience. I, I like Marx's political writing, I have to confess. I'm not a, not a huge fan of Capital, but I read it. And that's the other thing that, to go to Andrew's question, you get super invested in the books you spent such a fuck of a long time trying to understand. Like, nobody wants to be told, you know, uh, you, like, if you figured out Heidegger, you're a Heideggerian. Like, you just, there's no way out of it. You figure out Marx, you're a Marxist, because it's like, you know, is someone going to say, I spent five years of my life trying to figure this writer out, and now I just, I'm not into it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Fred. Hi, Mackenzie. Um, so to be a vulgar Marxist for a moment, 
uh, the notion of, of Marx, uh, Marx's notion of the sort of the motive force of history is that the, the forces of production develop mm. and at a certain point come into conflict or contradiction with the relations of production. Um, so, you know, we know how that story uh, was supposed to work uh, for capitalism. Mm. Uh, how do you see that story uh, playing itself out in, in this new, uh, uh, assertedly new uh, mode of production that you have uh, posited? Yeah, and, and to sort of do the, the inside baseball thing, what I did was go back from uh, capital to the preface to the contribution to the critique of political economy, which to me is the best thing Marx ever wrote. And it's this amazingly condensed philosophy of history that you could argue with, but uh, is incredibly condensed. Uh, and to kind of say, oh, before Marx wrote about capitalism, he wrote about modes of production. Uh, and there's a, a kind of um, uh, methodology for understanding social formations and their history. So let's go back to that bit to sort of figure out, oh, actually, maybe capital is about one moment in it and there's other ones. But yeah, I, I still, to me, that's still sort of fundamental, that it's um, your, your methodological starting point. You wouldn't want to stay here forever, but your starting point is uh, look to how are the necessities of social life being produced and how does that change through time? How, are, how is a surplus created? How are classes then formed in relation to the particular way it's created? And to me, that's a way of understanding all of human history. Uh, so not just capital or what comes after. So to me, that's kind of fundamental, is to go back to that really kind of vulgar... Um, and and it, it's very strong in the Anglophone philosophy that uh, New Left Review ended up not reading and going somewhere else, yeah? Uh, so to sort of go back to some of those lost sources to sort of rethink that. J.D. Bernal's Science and History, I think, was incredibly useful for me for thinking that through. He applies it to the whole of history. Uh, Joseph Needham's magnificent history of um, Chinese science and technology. Yeah, so you start with that basic question of how is social necessity produced? Thank you very much. Um, I was... Uh I find, uh, I find the thought that informational dynamics, which is my collective word for a range of phenomena you've described, um, are sort of a compelling and real social force. I find that claim really persuasive. What I'm having a bit more trouble with is locating them alongside the more traditional dynamics that you talked about, right? Um, one kind of very reductive approach is to say, ah, well, you know, they're just kind of tools of management, right, uh, over and above exploitation. You I'd be very surprised if you want to go that route, right? So that doesn't seem right. But it also doesn't seem right to kind of ontologize them and separate them from everything else. As I mean, maybe that was one of the things that was, you know, misconceived in the general intellect project. But maybe not. I'll, I'll leave that open to you to do the, uh, you know, postmortem. Um, um, so, yeah, what's the relationship between these two? It's clear that one's like more ontologically basic, but you know, yeah. maybe not. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, you know, there's a sort of bit of a move in. Uh, scholarship at the moment to sort of ontologize everything that I'm a little, little um, resistant to. Um, on the other hand, inf information is ontologically weird and we don't really sort of understand it or what it does or how it works. Like the philosophy of information is now a whole freaking field, you know. Um, so, but I'm more interested in how do we develop a technics that produces it as a possibility to uh, both use as forms of domination but also then think about so I'm taking a more historical path through thinking the, uh, you know, science studies piece of it even to begin with. But then how does that meet how everyone's uh, workplace gets transformed, yeah? Um, you know, I'm, I'm an academic, you know, and, and the thing everybody complains about all the time is there's always some new freaking software application to manage some, you know, this, that or the other that increases the amount of surveillance and increases the amount of aggregation of information that takes away my direct control over the labour process incrementally. And it's just staggering to me that no one makes that their actual field of study, right? It's like, maybe we should actually just study that. Like, how is this in our own actual workplace right here transforming what we do? Because that then joins those two things together. It looks like it's a management technology, but the thing is, not even my university ends up owning that information. It's owned by those companies that provided it, right? And that's why they're selling it for a certain cost, because they know they can aggregate the data, build other products, build control. So what you see is even the university losing its autonomy. Um, never had much to begin with, but it, but it loses what little bit of it that's left, precisely because you're 
uh, information is being extracted from you is exactly as how it is everywhere else. So I think it's possible to put those two things together in short. Maybe a couple more. Maybe not. Uh, One more. <laughs> Thank you for this talk. It was very interesting. Um, so I, I'm sure the argument has been made to you in the past that um, that a lot of uh, things of the past are um, very much like what you're describing. So uh, if you think about the beginnings of um, capitalism in the United States, the finance system was very, very much informational in its um, sort of constitution. And, uh, you know, um, insurance companies are based on actuarial mm -hmm. science, which is, mm -hmm. um, you know, statistical models of and information about how people die or, you know, how they get in accidents or whatever. And um, even like real estate, right? Is, mm -hmm. I say that I own Ohio and then I, you know, sell pieces of paper to people. And then you know those things get in the paper pyramided, um, and obviously now things are they look different. Um, but even say in the early 20th century, with like IBM and you know uh, their card sorting machines um, for dictatorships, this is very similar sort of in the model. But if we're to be consistent with this argument, there was nothing new about capitalism because all the elements of capitalism existed for centuries and centuries before it was even a thing, but they weren't dominant. So, my, my, so my question is, yeah. uh, like, what's, what's the, the essential rhetorical um, utility of saying those things aren't this? Um, and also looking into the future, like, what about, like, artificial intelligence and like the production of things by uh, information, you know, like bots and roboticism and all this, how does that play into? Um, well, yeah, I answered the first one. But yeah, but if, if we're consistent, then we would have to say, well, why, why do we bother talking about capitalism? It's still feudalism. Actually, Jody Dean's now making that argument uh, because all of the elements that would later be described as capitalism already existed for centuries. The key thing is they weren't dominant. Uh, the, uh, techniques of information wasn't dominant. Uh, and if you wanted to pick a date, you know, the, the transition points late 20th century, uh, you see the beginnings of it come out of World War II. And the reason being that World War II was a logistical exercise on a scale that no one had ever attempted in the entire history of anything. Uh, so, you know, how do you move that many pieces of so many different things all over the Pacific? It's like the main uh, piece of it, from the American point of view. It's like, ah, we need a whole new techniques to do that. Uh, and that'll then take, you know, 40 years to then work its way through to the point uh, that it could become a, a dominant and generalized infrastructure that capitalism subsumed in rather than the other way around. So that's kind of the transition. Um, it's hard to separate uh, the mystique of AI from what it might actually do. Um, I'm not a researcher who specializes in it. Uh, there's a lot of attention to uh, the way in which it's coming down to a bullshit in, bullshit out uh, kind of deal that, uh, all right, so you, you think you've got an algorithm that'll do certain things and replace certain labor processes, but where are you getting the data from and then how do you design an algorithm that produces the result? You basically model what's already there. Uh, so whatever is dysfunctional with what you already had, you've just basically automated so that you've taken certain people's labor away, but you haven't improved anything. Because it's really about making people's labor go away, not about improving anything. And the, the, one of the key examples of that is algorithmic policing. Yeah? Uh, Jackie Wang's book on carceral capitalism is really good on that. Uh, and there's, there's like some uh, software that police forces in the United States are buying where the police basically have to become salespeople for it. Uh, and, you know, the thing that's such a mystery uh, with algorithmic policing is, is more arrests happening, does that mean it's working, or less arrests, does that mean it's working? And these companies have argued both in the alternative, yeah? Uh, so it's kind of like there's a little bit of smoke and mirrors going on with AI, the possibility of um, automating certain labour processes that were involved in aggregating data and making decisions uh, has certain highly problematic aspects to it. But not to say uh, computation and big data is all bad, definitely not. We would not have climate science without it. 
and, and we would not know how totally fucked we are unless we do certain things without big data science. So to, to not say it's necessarily a bad thing, uh, or to say that about technology in general at all, but to look at uh, what forms of domination is it implicated in, in the particular way that it's becoming designed and implemented. Um, with no further questions, thank you. And that's our show. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.